this record. So I'm just absolutely amazed that it's week nine already. Um, I'm actually looking at the HESI stuff this week. Um, when I'm at my daughter's house, I seem to get a lot of work done because I don't have my swimming pool. So I, I tend to get some more stuff done for you. So what I'm going to be doing is looking at the HESI, look at previous HESIs, look at concepts covered, and make sure that the information I have covers it all so that I know that the concepts are there and you just have to understand them, be able to apply it, okay? So there is no quiz today. And Kelly, if you're feeling horrible, please go take care of yourself, okay? Um, so today we'll be covering chapters 48 and 49. It's neuromuscular and muscular skeletal dysfunction. Um, it's very straightforward. Uh, this week you have the dosage calculation worksheet done. If you're having issues with edition seven and eight, just let me know. If you are on edition eight, you're just gonna do one through 40. If it's uh, edition seven, it is what it is in the modules, okay? Because there's two different things. Now, all of your answers are there. And you're like, so why do I have you do it if your answers and the work is there? Well, I want you to, if you're copying it over, you should be looking at it. You remember it, okay? So that's why we have you do it. Because you're always going to see math, whether it's on our exams, right? Or you're going to see it on your NCLEX. And then you have discussion question number six. Start working on your practice exams and also your case studies, your next gen case studies. Um, you could get those done. Now, this week we're doing all the reviews. So I do mine on Thursday at two o'clock. Um, again, you know, they're going to be posted. Everybody will be there. I always post it in one place with all of your cahoots, everything all together to try to keep you organized. And then week 10 will be a, an exam and I'll be in another location. I'll be at my son's home. So um, I look forward to that and sharing my little new grandson with y'all. Any questions so far? Anything confusing? All right, let's go ahead and let's do our PowerPoint. And we're gonna do the cahoots too because we have time. For that one student who needs to do the quiz, we're gonna do it at the end. Now, it is a new quiz. What I would suggest is everybody can take it. It is just another practice on the information um, that you would have had, okay? So hematology and um, I believe it's cerebral. So it is actually, it's 10 questions. It's not gonna hurt you either way. And again, it's practice. If you wanna take it, you're more than welcome to do it. And we'll do that after we finish our class. So um, for those that just wanna practice, it's not gonna be great it's not for us. Or anything. You can okay. get a word on it, don't worry about it. But again, okay. giving you concepts, you know, and, and taxing your memory and saying, do I know this stuff? It's only extra. Why not? Doesn't hurt. Takes you what? 10 minutes, 15 minutes at most. <clears throat> so here we are, we're starting out with a muscular, skeletal, or articular dysfunction. These are what happens to the bones and to the joints on children, right? So first of all, let's talk about having a child who's immobilized. Now, there are children who are born due to congenital defects like, let's say, osteogenesis imperfecta. Let's say that a couple of times quick, right? And it's basically brittle bone disease. That child is going to be immobile and that child's probably never going to walk um, because those bones break so easily. So we're going to have to know how to take care of them. Um, again, there's injuries, fractured pelvises or fractured femurs, a bunch of different stuff that can make you immobilized. So we need to make sure that we get none of those side effects that come from it. So what are some of those things? Well, a child who's immobile, especially if they're paralyzed and sedated, which means they can't move, their muscles are gonna get atrophied, right? So we need to make sure if it's possible 
patient's condition to make sure that we're exercising range of motions, right? Because we want to keep that muscle as strong as we can and keep it flexible and movable. We know that there's gonna be a problem with nutrition, so we need to make changes in that. And of course, anything, lungs, heart, edema, making sure that we keep that heart moving, those lungs clear, et cetera. Now, if a child is immobile and is awake and alert, that child, whether it is for an, just a situation that's going on now, or it could be a lifelong situation like osteogenesis imperfecta, that child is going to be immobile. It's dependent on other people to move them around, right? So these children need a way they can get up and, and be a part of the world, right? Because if you get them in a room by themselves, they're gonna have no stimulus at all. They're going to feel like they're left alone in a room. They're gonna feel frustrated, helpless. And then it's gonna start with depression, anger, and then being really angry, that aggressive. And then they're not going to see other children. So developmentally, they are not going to be where they should. And again, remember stress does what? it makes you regress. So you're gonna see that thumb sucking or bedwetting, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you have a child who is immobile, what's gonna happen? Well, those extended periods of time where it's gonna be uh, some illness that maybe it's a couple months in bed, um, we need to manage that child you know, their minds, their bodies and their souls, right? If you wanna put it that way. We want to get them so that their lungs are good, their hearts good, there's no edema, that cognitively that they're aware, that they're stimulated. And it's not only the child, it's the family too. Now, there is counseling that can be done. I know many of the different diagnoses at the hospital I work have these parent groups, and usually they were monthly meetings. There was one in cardiac, there was one in the neurology floor, uh, one on the endocrine diabetes floor, and they share each other's concerns. And they have a lot of tricks of stuff that they have gotten um, when maybe it couldn't have been, uh, and they know the tricks, so they share them. And these uh, family groups, they become really close. They become almost like family themselves because they're both on that same highway. They're both, you know, facing the same things. Now, traumatic injuries happen all the time with kids. It could be just running around and falling down. It could be, of course, during sports. And there's all different things that can happen. Well, you can get a bruise and, you know, a bruise in itself does not seem like much, but just think, depending on the bruise, where it is, you've got to think of that bruise has released blood and it's caused an irritation, inflammation, and they're swelling. So if it's in a leg and it's swelling, you're always concerned about capillary refill, blood flow, right? Because you don't know what's happening inside of that leg or that arm. Um, so always you have to worry about that blood flow and um, doing capillary refills and checking for pulses. We know that contusion, contusions are painful. And one of the worst contusions we need to be concerned about is those crush injuries. Again, we don't know what all is going on inside. And again, blood flow is the big thing. Now, dislocation is something that happens when the bone pops out of the socket, Sim very simply. Now, the one that we think of with children is those little about three-year-old kids. We're swinging them with the arms, right? And we're playing and it's a lot of fun. Well, we could pop their elbow out of joint, causing a nurse-made elbow, right? Because their tendons, they're so flexible and they stretch easily and they could pop out and it hurts, right? Well, Down's children, extremely flexible. They can put both heads be, uh, legs behind their head, but they can pop their hips out of joint. And again, we're always concerned about, concerned about that blood flow and getting them put back in. I mean, nursemaid's elbow is just a pull and a click uh, when they come into the emergency room or urgent care. Um, the hip dislocation is a little bit more to get it there, but getting them back in the position as soon as we can is 
important than immobilizing that joint for a period of time to let that tendon you know, um, rest. Now sprains, I can't tell you how many sprains I had during childhood, I was a very much into sports. You know, go up to spike a ball, volleyball, come down on the ankle, and and you actually heard it ripping as you came down. Now they're very painful. What happens is it's stretched, it's torn, it's the uh, it can damage blood flow to there, and it's immediately if you can feel it swelling. I know as as I went on in my uh, sports through uh, college, as soon as I felt a sprain, because I got them all the time, my leg would go straight up in the air because I knew immediately it would start swelling. So strains, strain is something that happens when you um, occur it because it's you're using the same muscles over and over and over and over and over again. Again, it's painful to touch, but it's not an injury. It's just due to usage and it's over time. So how do we treat these things? Well, immediately rest it like I did, right? Stick the foot right up in the air. So, and icing it. Well, icing causes vasoconstriction, decreases swelling. <clears throat> how about a nice ACE bandage? You know, you know, con uh, confine that so it can't stretch, so it can't swell as much. And of course the elevation, and then immobilize and support. You know, many years ago with us, uh, when you had a sprain, they didn't put them in casts. But today, depending on the amount of the sprain that you get, they do because they need that immobilization. And sometimes sprains are harder to get through and make it feel better than a fracture. Now fractures, very common in kids. They're always up running on top of stuff, jumping, you know, thinking they're Superman and the monkey bars are a big one that I've heard falling off the monkey bars. And what do they do? They fall down, put the hands out. What happens? Fractures, radiolis, either one or two or one bone or two bones. Very common in children. Now, if you are seeing an infant with a fracture, this really needs to be looked at very carefully. It is extremely difficult to fracture a bone in an infant. I've seen one case of um, an infant that was brought to the triage room and the mother was crying, she was concerned, and it was an infant. So actually I pushed her in front of a lot of patients because it was an infant. And the mother was so distraught. Well, when I picked up that infant in my hands to put it on the scale to weigh the child, I felt my hand go into the skull, like it squished in, right? So, of course, the kid cried, got the weight, put it back in mother's arms, did my assessment, lights and, and bells went off in my head, something's wrong. Well, I went into the uh, head physician and I said, there's something wrong here. So he said, well, what I want you to do is what we call a body gram. You know, infants fit on one x-ray film cassette, right? They're so tiny. And we did one of the chest, the hips, the arms, and the legs. Well, we found a fractured femur, fractured ribs, fractured humerus, and it was a fractured skull too. Definitely, this is child abuse. It was a horrible thing to watch. And the hardest thing was, me maintaining my composure. You know, when you see that on, it's a three month old infant. When you see that, you want to hit somebody, right? And I had a named professional. What is your job in child abuse? Protect the child, right? Well, it gets worse. There were twins. We brought the twin in for investigation. And of course, DCF was called, charge nurse was notified, police were notified, all in the proper way. Social worker came in, everybody was brought in to what? Protect that child. Well, the second child had the same injuries. It got better or worse. There was a two-year-old boy walking around, had a fractured femur. So what happened to these children? Well, we admitted all of them to protect them until we could determine 
who was abusing these children. And what had happened <clears throat> is the father had lost his job and the mother was working three, four different jobs trying to make ends meet, right? And the father got frustrated. And what he did, and plug your ears if you don't want to hear this, he took the infants and smashed them against the surround, the tile surround and the tub because they wouldn't stop crying. Now, the end of the story, the mother was cleared, she was devastated, and the father is in jail where he should be. So what was my job? I wanted to scream and yell, didn't I? I was angry. To this day, I was, I'm still like <clears throat> about the whole thing. But what I did is I did my job. I protected that child. So child abuse is real. And I've seen different ones. But that was the most severe I've ever seen. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Or I'm going to sit here and start crying myself. School age children, the big thing is bikes, right? They're always falling off again, arms falling down again, most common because of that. And of course, sports, whether it's because they ran and they didn't warm up or just because of the nature of the sport. Now, there's different types of fractures. But what you need to know is simple. It's just a simple fracture, a crack doesn't come through them through the skin, whether it's aligned or not aligned, doesn't matter, it's simple. It's also called closed. Then there is the open or compound. This means like that picture on the right, bone came through the skin. Well, we're worried about osteomyelitis now, right? Because the skin has contaminants, we're worried of infection on the bone, the tissue, et cetera, et cetera. So that requires IV antibiotics. And then there's complicated because there's fragments everywhere or comminuted, again, where fragments are broken, it's in the tissues and it's creating a lot of pain. But simple and open are the two that you will see the most talked about. Now, children are always growing, right? So there is what we call growth plates in the bones. And it tends to where the bones grow so that the child gets smaller, the arms get longer, et cetera. It's called an epiphyseal plate. Now, when we fracture them, and this is off the monkey bars all the time, all down, hit the elbow, and it's fractured. Now, very important that we do a really good fix of these bones, putting them together so that they're straight. We will do surgery on this child. It's an open reduction in dermal fixation, getting all the pieces lined up correctly so that that child grows the same as the other arm, the other leg, and that it's not perfect, okay? Now, healing of bones. Me and you get a cast, it's gonna be on a minimum of three months, maybe longer. So it takes longer for adults to heal than an infant, well, an infant two to three weeks. But a cast on two to three weeks, they're good. And then as they get older, four, six, eight weeks, but the healing is a, a lot quicker. Usually you'll see kids come in, usually it's first day of summer vacation. They come in that right arm, um, but at least it's four weeks usually of healing and then they can enjoy the rest of their vacation, right? So when we suspect a child that has a fracture, of course, it's number one, you do a history happen, but doing an x-ray and then we can visualize it. I mean, that picture right there is a really good picture of just a common fracture in alignment. We'll put on a good old cast and then uh, maintain it there for like four weeks, six weeks, whatever it takes. And again, if you have a child who's walking and limping or doesn't want like an arm to move the arm or doesn't want to walk on a leg, you know most likely that it is fractured. So we reduce it, immobilize it, and make sure that we maintain that function and we don't want that arm or leg to be crooked or even finger. So how do we assess? <clears throat> so we have a cast on, we've seen a fracture, we know it was, he fell, it's okay, we put a cast on it. What are we gonna check and what are we gonna teach these parents and the child? Well, we want to know the six Ps, the pain point of tenderness, 
is it getting worse? Um, or is it not getting any better? That would say something's going on. Paler, if it's pale, that means no blood flow, which is also pulselessness. That means no blood flow, which means now you're having death of tissue. That right picture of that arm is something that happened with circulation. It was under the cast, nobody checked. I mean, yes, it's the extreme picture, but that can happen in reality. Paresthesia, you can't feel it, or you can't move it, or you feel that swelling, you feel pressure. These are things we will check for. We will teach the parents and the child. So casting them. You know, in pediatrics, we do have all the neat colors of casting. We have yellow and red, and two types of pink, and two types of blue, and green, and army, and rainbow, and orange. And I mean, you can make uh, the colors of Christmas, the colors of your favorite sports team, and you know something, it is a distraction. And actually the children go, oh, I get to have the colors of, like down here, Miami Heat. Yes, good, I can put my color. And it doesn't seem as bad. Now, taking care of these paths at home is really important. <clears throat> now, I've had children get a cast on, let's say on their arm, go home, put on their bathing suit, jump in the pool, get it wet. I saw one kid do it two times. The mother was about to kill the kid because now she's back at the ER getting another cast applied to it. And you can't just blow it out, dry it up because it'll get fungus or some sort of infection in there. It must be changed. So we need to teach them how to put on these bags for showering and bathing, um, how not to stick things in there. I mean, you've done your discussion question on it and all of those things. Um, little cool air sometimes helps. Sometimes you can't put a cast on. It must be in traction. And there's skin traction and there's skeletal traction. Now, why do we use traction? Well, most of the time I've seen it used for a fractured femur. Now that fractured femur is a big bone. And when that fractures, usually it moves because the muscles are so strong and those bones come apart and they stick in the other muscles and the nerves and it's really painful. So if we pull it out and line it up until we could do surgery, it decreases the pain and those muscle spasms. So it works really, really well. We could get to surgery. Sometimes we put these children in fixation devices and I've got a picture coming up on that. Purpose, really the fatigue of those muscles, put those ends together and immobilize it. And that starts that prevention of deformity. And the big thing, muscle spasms. Can you imagine little sharp edges of bone sticking your thigh muscles and those nerves and those spasmings? It is really painful. <laughs> now, this bottom right picture is usually your cervical spine, and that's a fixation device. It could go on an arm, a leg, a neck, many places. This one on the head is also for the cervical spine till surgery can be done. It pulls it, and little screws go into the scalp, and it goes onto a pulley, and it hangs freely. And the amount of weight and keeping it free and dangling are your priority. You document it and make sure that it's hanging. You want that pull at all times. You never, ever skin or skeletal traction ever take it off. Now, there's a lot of different names for traction. <clears throat> now, Brian traction is when they're up in the air like that little girl. Usually that could be hip dysplasia. Um, we have buck traction, the most common thing we think of with skin traction. It's like a little boot on the lower leg and it pulls releasing that femur to go straight. Again, 24 hours a day, keep that weight dangling and free um, so it, it's not on the floor, okay? and you don't have the heel to the foot of the bed. 
we want that pull to be maintained, okay? Very important. And then that cervical traction are those garden well toms that I just talked about, another cervical. <laughs> so distraction in the femur again, is to take that bones and separate it and put it in alignment. And that's where the bone fragments are going to be. Um, the bone starts making new bone there. We use this a lot for children that have one leg or one arm shorter than the other. We can actually make it longer so that you're not gonna have a short leg and a long leg. But these are external fixation devices. You know, the crazy thing is my uh, physician, my general physician, he had short legs with problems with his knees. He just did them bilaterally. He said, most painful thing he's ever done, but he's two inches taller now. So he was excited. It's like, you're crazy for doing that. Now, sometimes children are born, <clears throat> they could be without a finger, without an arm, without a leg, or I've actually seen born with a fibula, but not a tibula. So it doesn't work. So they have to do an amputation so that they can get around because you need both bones for it to be able to be ambulated, okay? Sometimes we have um, accidents uh, for whatever reason, where the leg needs to be amputated or the arm or whatever. Remember, you're still gonna have all that pain, phantom pain, all of those things that you see in adults. And our goal with any amputation is to maintain function, whether it's walking or even the it's moving to be able to use. So um, we'll be uh, fitting them for prosthesis as soon as we can. And of course, doing the therapies, physical therapy. Now sports, kids love sports. They're competitive. They love to win, right? Remember these kids work so hard at winning. Sometimes they have these overload injuries, like they're doing so much and they're pushing and not giving the body a chance to rest. And that's what you call an overload injury. Also, another thing we need to remember in children is that they have proper equipment, helmets or the shin guards or the shoes or whatever it is that they need so they can protect themselves from injury. Overuse injuries is just that. When you do over and over and over and over again, and it causes those stress fractures, okay? I mean, look at that little gymnastic there. I mean, that's quite a stretch there. And you know, children wanna win, they wanna be the best, so they're gonna push themselves. Now, DDH, developmental dysplasia of the hip, is when you have the hip socket and you have the femur bone and it's not born where it should be. It's up here somewhere. And it's at birth, it's congenital. Girls are more than boys. So what do you see? How would you know? Well, you're going to see if you turn them on their tummies, their folds and their, their butts are gonna be different because one is higher, called the gluteal folds, all right? Also, they're going to have, you can't, it's like a restricted abduction. You can't move them the way they should. You've ever had a baby, and you go to the pediatrician, first visit, you know, if they take the knees and go up and down and out, they're looking and they're listening for those clicks that you might hear on these um, hip joints that are not where they should be. So also, because this bone is up here, you're gonna have a shorter leg. So you have folds, shorter legs, positive Ortolani, positive Barlow, and that's going to be uh, what you're going to say. How do you take care of it? Well, you know that we have children um, that they heal very quickly, right? So as early as possible, we put them in what we call this Pavlik harness. And you can see it there. It's for 23 hours a day. You take it off and bathe and you put it on. It 
does abduction of the hip. It's an important concept. An abduction of the hip. And it keeps that hip joint there and we leave it there until that hip socket is back to the way it should be. Now, sometimes it doesn't work. So as they get older, we could put on a spica cast, which is from the nipple line to the mid thigh. Um, or after that, they need to do surgeries and they need to like make those tendons. Um, they're, they're pulling them the way they shouldn't be. So we release those tendons so we can put them back where they need to go. Another thing is club foot. <clears throat> you do not need to know all of these names. There are just different ways foot could be, could be in, could out, up, over. I mean, it could be all different ways, okay? It just means that hip, that hip, that foot and that ankle are not the way they should be. There's something um, that's abnormal. So what do we do? We do something called a Ponsetti method of casting. Remember, kids, these babies heal really quick, right? So every week, not every month, every week, this child must go in to the orthopedic and change the cast. And I, I, did, I found this picture of all the different casts and you could see how they kept going and moving them. And if you look at the dates, they're like seven to 10 days in between. And they will put those feet back to where they should go. Now, as they get older, they must be followed with orthopedic um, and maybe special shoes might be needed um, and they must be watched closely so that they don't get a shorter leg or inverted foot, all of those. So it must be watched as they get older. Now I mentioned quickly osteogenesis imperfecta. And this is a um, horrible disease to as a nurse to take care of because you're worried about just picking a kid up, changing a diaper that you might crunch a bone. I mean, that's how really um, fragile these children are. So, you know, what do we do? Well, there's no cure. And we have some ideas of what to do, but there's it's not a cure. It's just maybe you give some biphosphonate therapy um, and to try to take care of these children that you're not uh, giving more fractures than you can. And another goal is to, as they are healing from fractures, to have them in a position where they can be mobile. And these children at the hospital I worked at, they would be in one of these motor wheelchairs and you would hear them coming down the hall and they're going beep 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 usually when they're trying to get to the cafeteria <clears throat> they're alert they're cognitively aware it's just that their bones they're very fragile now late calf birth this is aseptic necrosis of the femoral head so it's not infection it is the tissues dying on that head of that femur and why did it happen? Like, we're really not sure. Um, and it's something to do with disturbed circulation. So it's an ischemic aseptic necrosis. Sorry, I don't wanna drive you nuts, <laughs> get you dizzy. So what happens and what do you see? Well, all of a sudden you'll see a child with a limp. You also see them and it's tender, it's stiff, and you, know, you can't move your leg like you should, so limited range of motion. There's really not a history that they fell down or anything. It's like, you, you can't, like, why did this happen, right? Usually you'll see it um, at the, when you wake up in the morning, because you're really stiff, or after you've been pushing yourself a while, then you feel it. So how do we determine it is like calf birth. Well, to do an x-ray. And the, the femoral head, you'll see like some fuzziness at the end. And you, that's where you're like, oh, there's something going on. And that's the um, ischemic necrotic area that's starting to form. So 
again, what is our goal? Well, we don't want to lose that femoral head, right? So what do we do? Bed rest. No weight bearing, okay? We'll put them on NSAIDs because it's anti-inflammatory, right? It's, you know, decreases the inflammation. Home traction. Home traction where box traction, pulling it so that there's no pressure on the end of it. Sometimes it needs surgery, but maybe not. But again, diet, high protein um, on these children because protein aids with bones. Now there's three different curvatures of the spine. Now kyphosis is that, you know, neck, the home back is another way to call it. It's usually older people you see, it, it's just their posture, right? Lordosis is when the lumbar spine arches and you lean back type thing. And I'm gonna go into one of the neuromuscular uh, diagnoses that has this lordosis. Um, sometimes it's due to uh, problems with the hip. Sometimes you see it with those congenital dislocated hips. Uh, sometimes these are heavier children. And then scoliosis. This is the one that you know, you're going to be more uh, quizzed on, uh, tested on. It is more common. It's the most common of the spinal deformities. And you're gonna see an S-shaped curvature of the spine. <clears throat> A lot of times you don't see it at birth. It's just not there. But that pre-adolescent growth spurt, remember 25% of their height, occurs that you know, 12, 13, 14 year old age, sometimes it then curves, okay? So what happens and what do you do? Well, all of a sudden you're gonna see that their clothes are weird. Um, some, they used to years ago do uh, school screening to look for it, but they don't do that anymore. So how do we treat this curve? I mean, the biggest thing is think of this, you have this curve and you're leaning to a side. That means one lung is being compressed because of that curvature. That's our biggest concern. That's why if this curve in that area is greater than 40 degrees, um, it gets like 45, you'll see in some books, you're going to need surgery to straighten that curve out, okay? Underneath that, because like 30 degrees, 35 degrees, what they'll do is they'll put some braces on. Now, remember, these are those adolescents, body image, right? Here they are with these hard plastic things on, and now they feel different. So it's a really hard body image identity crisis for these adolescents. So what they do is they put them on these braces. Today, they're doing pretty colors and stuff to try to help make it less, you know, body image thing, right? And it's on 23 hours a day. They take it off, they shower, they bathe, they put a t-shirt underneath and they put the brace on. And then the other thing, it's physiotherapy. They need to strengthen the muscles so that those spine can go straight. I've seen no surgery approach do well. My daughter's best friend since age four had a scoliosis really bad. And I watched her go through the process. And it really, really, now not completely, but a lot better. The name of the surgery is what we call Harrington or Luke rods. And what they do is they take a rod on either side of the spine and they put little uh, screws in it and attach it to the spinal column and try to get, now they can't do a complete, you know, non-curve, but the best that they can. Now, postoperatively, these children got a rod in their back. This child must be log roll. You can understand why, right? Put a pillow between their legs and turn them because we're, of course, turn, cough, deep breathe, right? 
and then osteomyelitis. I mean, children are always going around, no shoes on, out wherever, and they step on something and they can get um, osteomyelitis. So what do you see? Well, you're gonna see usually redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, and then you'll start to see the fever. Of course, leukocytosis or the white count's gonna go up, right? There's an infection in there. So um, you're gonna see elevated white count, leukocytosis, and those fevers. So what do we do? Well, if we're seeing that there is this leukocytosis, elevated white count, we need to know what germ it is, what bacteria. So there will be a culture done. So we know what antibiotic the child needs so we can get it with the first antibiotic, not the third or fourth, right? Of course, we're doing x-rays. You don't always see it. That, you know, because it's usually soft tissue that is the inflammation. And then we do bone scans, which will show a lot better. So how do we treat it? Well, osteomyelitis is an infection. Usually, you know, skin is staph. It could be a lot more depending, but they're gonna need intravenous antibiotics. And it could be three weeks, it could be six months, depending. Now, because these are antibiotics, usually your aminoglucosides, these are your vancomycin, amikacin, dentamycin, right? These will need very close monitoring because it can um, affect your kidneys. And remember, phototoxicity, it can affect your hearing. So we'll be doing peak and trough levels and making sure that our doses are not too much. So we have to worry about that also. Now, these children usually will have a pick line um, so that we don't have to keep sticking them for IVs. Sometimes you can't do a pick line, they'll even go in more of a central line, you know, a Proviac or uh, whatever they need in order to maintain good access. And again, we're talking about bones, diet, always nutrition worry about with children. That's one thing we need to address so that they are strong enough to fight these uh, diseases, high in protein. And these children usually will be home or in the hospital. Again, these children feel alone, they feel isolated, you know, they need things to keep them occupied so that they're not feeling shut off and put in a room, you know, by themselves, just like I said earlier. Now, this is a cancer, but it's a bone cancer. And it's usually those big bones, it could be the tibia, the fibula, the ulnar, it could be the scalpula, it could be the jaw. And um, these usually children, adolescents, it's not the older people. <clears throat> and it's the second most common malignant um, type of tumor. Radiation, chemotherapy, and if you can, we will take it out if we can. And of course, prognosis is always better if no metastasis. Now, JIA is also JRA, right? Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And what's the difference of treatment for adults or children? Nothing. It's the same treatment. So we know it's either immune, environmental. Uh, we don't know how it happens. I wish we knew so you could cure me too. But you usually see this um, ages one to three. You start seeing little clues. And a lot of times we don't catch it. So what are the symptoms? <clears throat> well, when the muscles and the bones and the joints don't move, or you're sleeping, right? And then you get up to move, it's painful, it's stiff. It's like you're limping, you're bent over, it's hard to walk. So you would see morning stiffness, it's a big thing. As they get older, you're gonna see the joints being disfigured. I mean, I've got one finger that's a little crooked. This one's got a lump. I mean, more than that, I don't have, but you know, I feel that swelling and that stiffness. And then there's something called uveitis, which is the redness of the eye. 
Um, these and it could cause blindness. So these children must be followed with ophthalmology also. Now, it took eight years to diagnose me. So no definitive tests, none. There's things that we know, the inflammatory factors that you can test, but unless you're in crisis, they don't always show. You have ANA, you have rheumatoid factors, you have a CRP, c reactive protein, even white cells, um, you can see elevated, but they're not always. So because of that, it's really hard to diagnose it. So our goal, we don't want those joints to stiffen up. We want to preserve that function. And we're trying to prevent those deformities. And those symptoms are pain and stiffness. So initially, what do we do? Well, usually at first, they'll be telling you for pain, do NSAID support, ibuprofen, or there's all different sort of, you know, NSAIDs that are out there um, that are prescription. There's almost the same, but sometimes they'll choose one of them. That one will work because it's not anti-inflammatory. Steroids are that band-aid that is needed initially to help with the swelling, but shouldn't be on long-term. I mean, I went into Cushing syndrome because they had it on me for two years. So corticosteroids are great, they work, but again, those side effects. And then they usually put you on initially those methotrexate, whether it is by pills or it is it by um, injection sub Q. And then they'll put you on those rheumatoid factors, those biologics, those embryo, Numera, infusions, you've heard of Remicade is the big one, all different things that you can do. So how are we gonna manage it besides meds? Well, I'm gonna be in my pool and that's why I'm always in my pool. It's because it's an easy place to move, it feels good, I'm weightless, <laughs> it keeps my joints moving and it's a good thing, right? And it helps with the pain. You need to keep yourself healthy. And the medications and those infusions, whatever you're on, you need to be compliant with them. You can't just give or take. You must be really consistent with it. Now, they say encouraging use of heat. Now, you put on heat on me, I scream. I want cold. Give me an ice bucket full of ice and water, and I'll stick my feet in it. You put me with heat, and I will immediately have a lot of pain. So everybody's different is my point here. And these children, you know, they're upset. Why do I always hurt? Why am I stiff? You know, so again, giving them good support. Now we have lupus. And what does lupus affect? This is all the organs, right? Usually uh, more common in girls ages 10 to 19, African-American, Asian, Hispanic. You might see it running through the family and it can be caused by many different things. And, you know, in South Florida, the one things I would mention is that overexposure to sunlight. Um, but it could be due to those girls. You see 10 to 19, isn't that when, you know, menstruation starts, all those hormonal imbalances that could cause it. It can be due to drugs, infection, stress, and of course, sunlight. So what do you see? Well, you're gonna see that butterfly rash, they call it, right? You might see this child just complaining of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and pain, um, which might bring them to the doctor. And then it gets to seizures, uh, pleurisy, pericarditis, because it's attacking organs, and then proteinuria, renal failure, because it's attacking the kidneys. So it's be looking for everything. So what is our goal? Well, number one is compliance, big thing. Um, and to try to keep away, you know, those uh, outbursts, those exasperations. And again, being careful with the sunlight, right? So Kristen, 10 years of age, sustained a fracture in the epiphyseal plate of her right fibula when she fell out of a tree. When discussing this injury with her parents, the nurse should consider what? What is an epiphyseal plate?
Is it B? B. Absolutely. Remember, this is, if you get a fracture here, that's your where you grow. And you want the growth to be the same on both sides of the body. And you don't want to crook it. Very good. All right. Neuromuscular, muscular uh, uh, dysfunction. You think neuromuscular, you think cerebral palsy, right? Cerebral palsy, what is it? It's a group of permanent disorders of the development of movement and postures. That means the body, it's almost like the light switch going on and off and you can't move that good and you're like stiff. I think it's a great explanation of it. It's you can't, you know, um, have a smooth motion. Um, let's say taking a spoon of soup, drawing, you're more jerky with it. A lot of these children have epilepsy, 15 to 60%. What causes it? Well, could be the brain just as abnormal, could be something to do with blood flow, some sort of degeneration. You see a lot of these with these premature, low or very low birth weight children. A lot of times I see cerebral palsy when there was an anoxic or hypoxic episode, especially at birth. Um, I've seen children where they tried to be born vaginally, couldn't come out. And at the last moment, they had to run for C-section. <laughs> and that child usually has some sort of anoxic, hypoxic episode. So we don't always know that a child's going to be born with cerebral palsy. I mean, if they're premature, low birth weight, yeah, we're going to be checking that more. But it's, again, checking developmental milestones, which we've learned about. Normal. Now, spastic, most common, that when you think of cerebral palsy, you think spastic cerebral palsy. This is that hypertonicity that, I mean, we're like, you're... It's like you're so excited, you're shaking and you're stiff. I can't imagine being that stiff all the time, the pain in the muscles, right? These children have a hard time sitting, balancing. Um, that's why they usually are strapped into wheelchairs if we can put them in there because they will fall over. Um, it's just hard for them. The neurological examination. Looking at nerves and EMGs and CTs, um, and then, of course, the history is where we're going to probably get those diagnoses, and then we're going to be doing some sort of metabolic genetic testing, seeing if there's something there that can explain it. What do we see? Well, I told you it's all about these fine and gross motor developments, you know, normal growth and development of a child. You're going to see it delayed. You're going to see abnormal motor, as in at soup, you're like shaking so hard to get it, right? It's that alteration in muscle tone. Um, children with that abnormal postures are not able to sit up straight. They're, they're bent over. You can't straighten them up. Reflexes, of course, they're abnormal, and um, you're going to see them, even speech, many things going to be uh, affected. Our goal is to give them the ability to move. Um, that's why I have these wheelchairs. I mean, this little boy down here, he's in little splints. He is strapped to that trike, and that kid can move around, and that makes that child happy. He has the ability to move and he's also exercising when he's moving so he doesn't know it. So it's good many different ways, right? Another thing is communication. You know, one of my favorite little boys that I dealt with when I was working um, clinicals is a kid called Jonathan. Six years old, spastic cerebral palsy and he was not able to talk. Now his face and his smile would light up a room, but he couldn't communicate. So what did he have? He had an iPad where he could explain what did he want, what did he need, and that helped. He was even taught um, how 
but circles and ovals and squares and colors. I mean, years ago, we didn't teach children with cerebral palsy anything. Why would we do that? There, there's nothing they can do. Well, our minds have changed so much in the treatment of these children that we are teaching them and making goals. And when they reach them, making new goals. And this really helps with, you know, their, their mental feelings, right? They're feeling good, at least they can express themselves. We used to just get them up, put them in a chair, feed them, bathe them, give them their meds and put them for a nap and wake them up. I mean, it was just very simple care today. It's speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, keeping these kids up and mobile and the ability to express and to be able to move around. Another thing is we need them with other children, social, to be with kids. They can see what's going on with them and that will help them want to do more. Because they're spastic and they tend to, you know, they're Sometimes their feet point forward. We want to keep them in an ability that if they, we can get them up and walking, that their muscles aren't contracted. We want to keep everything loose. So ankle foot braces, they even have them for the wrist things. We'll do surgery if they have these spastic deformities where they can't stretch them out anymore. They're going to put them on like baclofen, which is spasms and seizures try to relax the body. Botulism is used really well. Um, little uh, Jonathan was on carbidopa, levodopa, which is used in Parkinsonism, right? That's that spasming. They're using it in cerebral palsy now. Also, dental hygiene. These children, a lot of them have seizures, right? Think about phenoyton, dilantin, gingival hyperplasia, right? So we need to keep those mouths clean. And again, therapy, therapy, therapy. So what's the prognosis? <laughs> you know, these kids can do really, really well. As long as there's not another condition that goes along with it, you know, that can, you know, uh, cause um, death earlier. But these children, many of them can walk. Many a times it'll be with a walker or something. And, and some kids can't, but we give them that motor ability with those wheelchairs or whatever. They are cognitively impaired, but they're further than we ever thought they would. Now, family, you know, needs to have many things at home, right? These are children, they start with babies and young children, they're easy to lift up and move, right? As they get older, they're going to need things and devices to help them so that they don't end up with bad backs, right? Because you have a bad back paralyzed because of all this moving or in that severe pain, um, you're going to need no help to them. So making sure the family has everything they need. Teaching families how to give them medications. Safety precautions. You know, these children you do get spastic and roll out of bed and fall on the floor or in a wheelchair, slide out. That's why we're always having those braces on to hold them. And again, physical, speech, occupational therapy, um, to let that kid be as best as he could be. And again, those families need support. This is a child that requires a lot of care. Again, family supports are good. Now, you've heard about neurotube deficits with folic acid, right? What is a neural tube deficit? You should, one month before you become pregnant, start on folic acid to prevent neural tube deficits. This is when a part of the spinal cord and meninges is born on the outside of the body. The one that we always uh, think about um, that you'll see, this is the one, uh, one of these that's always mentioned in exams and quizzes is what we call a myelomeningocele. And both these pictures are a myelomeningocele. So at birth, usually we'll see this in an ultrasound and we will be prepared for them. These children will be born C-section because we don't want to disrupt those meninges or that spinal cord. So, what happens at birth? 
well, you receive this child and he's got this big blob of um, meninges and spinal cord are there and this moist tissue. Number one, he needs sterile normal saline and a sterile dressing to maintain the integrity of that tissue there, okay? Now, think about what happens with this. So instead of that spinal cord running straight and all of those nerves going straight and then going out to the body, they are stretched up and out of the body. You're going to have some nerve damage, right? So what nerve damage would you see? Well, number one, it's the lower part of the lumbar spine. So you have to worry about urinary retention because they don't feel it. It's like a spinal cord injury down there. So they can't urinate. So you got to worry about that. Also, those nerves have been stretched, some broken. Sometimes there's no movement, complete paralysis in the lower extremities or partial. Most of these children end up in wheelchairs and most of them end up with intermittent catheterizations. So your two priorities, urine function and your um, bowel function, and they're, they're gonna have decreased motion. As I said, that um, neural tube has to do um, with early development. So that's why we want those folic acid really um, soon. It can be caused genetic, can be caused maternal obesity, diabetes, or sometimes low B12. Again, we're not completely sure. So once they come out, number one, normal saline, sterile, 0.9 normal saline, and it's good sterile dressing to maintain the integrity of the moisture of the tissue and to prevent infection. Um, we're gonna be worried about movement, lower extremities. These children from birth are made latex allergy. Think about all the catheterizations that might be done. So immediately, no latex for these children. And again, watch their bowel control. These children are normal. Manuel Louis was an infant. I want to tell you another story. Manuel Louis, born, beautiful little boy. And mom was sitting there crying over this child in the newborn ICU. And I was in the room alone. The other nurses said, gone to break, whatever. Wasn't my kid, but I couldn't leave my mother crying. So I went over to her. I said, what's the matter, mom? He goes, they don't know if my baby's going to make it. And I says, mom, and the baby looked just like this picture. And I says, mom, your baby's going to be okay. Yes, there's going to be issues that you're going to have to work with. But I know you're going to be a great mother and he's going to get all the care he needs. I says, do me a favor. Sit in that chair. You are going to hold your baby right now. So I took care of the back. Did what I had to do rolled him up in a blanket and took him out of the warmer and I handed mom her baby. And I said, isn't he gorgeous? And she just sat there and cried and rocked. Well, let me tell you the end of the story. 13 years later, I'm working down in the emergency room and the mother sees me. <laughs> she says to the clerk, oh kid, my name was always Betty Boop at the hospital. As you'll remember that name. Says, go get Boop. I want to talk to her. So I went over and I looked at her and I looked at her son in a wheelchair. And I don't even know how. So I don't know where my car keys are. But I knew that was Manuel Louis. She said, I've been looking for you for a long time. This is Manuel. He just had his eighth grade graduation. He went with a date. He's doing well at school. I want to thank you because what you did that day meant the world to me. And then she pulled out a key ring with a picture about this big. And it was me holding Manuel Louis. And she gave me a hug and told me, thank you. It was like what things we as nurses can make a big difference. So again, folic acid, like I said. Wording Hoffman 
is another sort of spinal muscular atrophy. When you think wording Hoffman, it is floppy infant and they usually die before age two. You see it uh, almost immediately. You know, the kid's not lifting his head up, not rolling. There's all these clues to it. Um, and none of these kids make it there. We don't know why again, um, but uh, it's a devastating diagnosis. Touche muscular dystrophy. I mean, this is one of those things, again, you're going to see on your NCLEX for sure. It's like the tetralogy of Fallot. They love this diagnosis. And what is it? Well, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is one of the most common, but it's pseudo-hypertrophic muscle dystrophy. It is, um, comes from mom. It's X-linked. It is mostly males, okay, if not all males, and you usually see it about three to seven years old is when you see it, and what do you see? Well, it is like a muscle deterioration, so these muscles start to get weaker and weaker and contract, and you can't walk. You see big, thick calf muscles. You're like, look at these muscles, they look strong, they can't walk and they're falling over. And it's all about muscles, right? So again, progressively weak. They usually die either from respiratory, which is that diaphragm muscle, right? Or cardiac failure. Of course, the heart is a muscle. How do we diagnose this? Well, it has to do with muscles and muscle weakness. So there's something called an electromyography or an EMG. And that picture up there to the right is a picture. <clears throat> they can do it with little of those tabs or they can do it with needles. Usually they'll just put those like um, cardiac monitor sort of things on there. It works well. And what they do is they put a little electrical charge and you watch the muscle spasm. With this test, we need to warn the parents, and if the child's older and understands that it will cause those muscles to hurt when you're done, because you're like making them all of a sudden spasm with this electrical current there, okay? So it is temporary, but just warn them. Signs that you will see with these children is because they're getting muscle weakness, they're gonna waddle when they walk. And because they're weak, they're going to fall. Do you know what cower sign is? It's what I do every time that I'm on the floor and need to get up. I take my hands and walk up my legs, and that will catch my body so I can stand up straight. Cower sign. I call it the old lady <laughs> get off the floor sign. And then there's lordosis. Remember I said there's something that's that lumbar spine that's arched backwards. These children usually walk on their tippy toes with those big calf muscles, okay? They're going to have mild to moderate mental impairment. So they are delayed. And because of this muscle weakness, they are obese. They will be heavier children. There's really no like set, this is what you do type treatment. But the goal is to try to keep those muscles moving as long as possible, that child active, range of motion, bracings, sometimes there are contractures, we do surgery. And again, this is X-linked genetic counseling, especially if the parents want more children and if they already have another boy, very important. And Gillian Barre. Gillian Barre, whether it's an adult or child, it is the same thing and the same treatment. Now, children are not affected as much as adults, but they still can be. And it's what we call a demyelination polyneuropathy with progressive uh, paralysis. Oh, what does that mean? Well, it's all about the nerves and the nerves stop working. And if the nerves stop working, you'll see things. For instance, Gillian Beret starts with just tenderness. 
of the muscles because the nerves aren't working that great. And you'll see some numbness, paresthesia, and weakness. You're going to see it start from the feet. So you're going to see them falling over, right? You're going to see them, their knees buckling because their muscles, their nerves aren't working. It's going to go from the feet, goes up to the trunk. And when it gets to the trunk, you might see incontinence or constipation. But the big thing and the most primary concern is, isn't your diaphragm a muscle? It causes a diaphragm to stop working. So you stop breathing. So nursing priority, patient diagnosed with Gillian-Barre, you need to monitor their respiratory status. This child will be on an O2 SAP monitor or monitor, and we concerned about respirations. So how are you gonna treat this child? Well, we're gonna, of course, it's all system, uh, symptomatic, but our uh, most concern is respiratory effort. So we'll be supporting it whichever way we have to. Now, maybe steroids work, but IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulins, and plasmapheresis. These children will be on a ventilator. So what happens is the kid comes in and all of a sudden the respiratory distress, their diaphragm don't work, they're placed on a ventilator. Depending on how long they're on a ventilator, they might end up with a trait. And what's pretty neat to watch, when you have a ventilator, you put on a certain rate, right? Let's say it's 14 breaths a minute. Now, if you breathe over it, you'll see that. With Gillian Barre at the acute stage, it will only be 14 breaths a minute. And then all of a sudden, you're going to see 16, 18. You're going to see them start to be able to breathe over the rate set by the ventilator. And then it goes from the chest, and then it goes down, and then back to the feet. So it starts on the feet, ascends up to the lungs, and when you recover, it goes uh, descending from the chest down to the feet. Tetanus, <clears throat> step on a rusty nail, right? It's also called lockjaw. And it's like muscle rigidity, and it's all about the neck and, and, and the jaw. And it tenses up really hard. So all of a sudden, you're going to see the stiffness, tenderness in the neck, and you can't open the mouth that good. And maybe you're going to see spasms in the cheeks and the lips and whatnot. Well, then all that swelling occurs, and you're gonna start, you can't swallow, you go into laryngospasm, um, and your respiratory muscles don't work, your abdomen is rigid, the limbs are rigid, and these chill is painful, as painful can be. And it's hard to take a breath. So what we need to do is um, watch respiratory. Um, these children usually, what we need to do is a powerful muscle relaxant. So they're going to be paralyzed, sedated on a ventilator to let those muscles relax, okay? Again, all that stuff worried about their respiratory status um, is what we are working on. These children, many of them die. They say if they can get them to four days out, they'll be okay. And we treat it with Tetatox, the vaccine, <clears throat> trying to stop the progression of tetanus. So any cut that we get on children um, should be cleaned with soap and water, an antibiotic ointment on it. Um, and if it's uh, an old nail, they need to go and get boosters because tetanus is nothing to mess with, okay? So, the, what do we do? These kids will be in the ICU. We're going to be monitoring everything. We're going to keep cleaning that wound. And uh, again, those muscle relaxants. Now, botulism, good old honey, right? 
Everybody likes some honey in their tea. Well, they say with children, you shouldn't give it till at least two years of age. Some books say one year, two years. <clears throat> and what happens is, is honey, we don't know if the, when it was prepared, we don't know how long it's been on the shelf. We might have a date. We don't know if it was done cleanly, sterile. Um, so it's something that we shouldn't mess with with children. I know many grandmas say, your kid is constipated, give them a little honey and it works. Or the Cairo syrup, that light or dark corn syrup. And yeah, it works, but it could be botulism. What do we see? Well, usually it's the vomiting that brings them in. Um, and then the weak, dizzy headaches, uh, problems with vision. And again, this goes into life-threatening respiratory paralysis. We give IV botulism hemoglobin. And again, support respiratory. And whenever a child, even your adults, are intubated for long periods of time, you always, one of our biggest concerns is nutrition, making sure the body gets what it needs in order to heal itself. And therapy goes until they feel better. Spinal cord injuries, what do they do from? Well, a little bit of anything with kit, right? Motor vehicles, sports, birth, uh, they fell down, um, hyperflexion, hyperextension, you know, a car accident, the head goes forward, back, um, coop, coop to coop, they call it. <clears throat> it's something that can happen. And what is our goal? You want to hear another story about a 16-year-old? 16-year-old boy, I'm primary um, nurse on the trauma team that day, which means I'm in charge. Nobody does anything unless I'm telling them to do it, especially when you talk about spinal cord injuries. Number one priority, proper immobilization, okay? That's number one. You're always saying it's respiratory. <laughs> number one, proper immo immobilization. Very, very, very important. So we get a call, 16-year-old boy playing soft, uh, baseball, slid into third base, was um, found, um, went unconscious, um, right leg, can't move, left leg is slightly um, numb. Um, they put him on a board with the collar, everything, and brought him to me. My goal, again, keeping that neck straight, during his stay in the emergency room, again, his right leg, he can't move, and his left leg is feeling numb, okay? The kid is scared to death, awake, alert. So I got to make sure that kid keeps calm and relaxed. I actually did an MRI, that 40-minute procedure in the ER to find out exactly where that break was. He had what we called a C5, C6 angulated fracture of his cervical spine. I mean, it was, looks like a, a little triangle. It was quite um, bad. So we did the MRI, saw what it was. Um, we brought him up to the ICU. We put him on those tongs, right? Actually put him on a cooling blanket with some good sedation, and the next day he went to surgery. Well, two weeks later, I went up to his room to check him out. He was moving everything with some slight residual right leg numbness. He was going to therapy um, after he left the hospital, but he gave me a hug and thanked me. That kid, let me tell you, I lost a couple of years of my life making sure that kid was safe, but today that kid is fine. A year later, he came in to give me a hug and tell me everything was great. Came back to the ER looking for me. So a progressive infantile spinal muscular atrophy and the most common paralytic form of poppy infant syndrome is what? A terrible one. It's wording Hoffman, I won't make you suffer. Did you like my stories today? I think sometimes stories makes you understand it a lot better. All right, let's go ahead and do a kahoot. Who wants to win today? 
Ashley. Oh, Charles wants to win. Okay, he was first. All right, Charles, I'm rooting for you. Quite a few questions on this one. So this is actually our last class of information like this. Next week, we do our exam and I'm gonna start HESI reviews. So we'll do a HESI review. I'm also going to do an open question and answer on topics and concepts that you need to know on Sunday. Uh, usually I do it like one or two in the afternoon, the week before HESI, so week 11 Sunday. Uh, again, it's all going to be recorded for you. And students tell me they love that open session. It really helped. All right, week nine. Amazing. A multi. What is the priority for a nurse to assess following a CAST application? Oh, there's 39 questions on this one. Not horrible. Remember, there's six parts to the PPPP, right? So pulses, pain, movement, sensation, yes. Always remember it's six. What should the nurse monitor after a soft tissue injury? So remember those neurovascular checks. Remember there is always concern about swelling, et cetera, with it. Got to be careful. Movement, swelling, blood flow. A fracture that penetrates the skin is called what? Remember treatment is going to be, you know, antibiotics. That's the one about the open fracture, right? What's the other name for it? And it's called compound. Good job. What is the priority nursing care of a child with a compound fracture? So IV antibiotics is the biggest thing about the compound fracture. That's your priority um, because the infection can become systemic, right? Now, looking at neurovascular and capillary refills, yes, that is important, but the infection. What is priority nursing care for a child who fell off a second floor balcony? I've actually seen this. They got on a chair, went on top, and they went head first out. Again, remember any sort of injury, you're always worried about the spine and possible paralysis. So strict immobilization, always priority. Principles of managing soft tissue injury include
Rice, rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Really good. And you would never put heat on a soft tissue injury because it will swell more. And then it's going to occlude blood flow. Epiphyseal plate fractures in children may do what? Disrupt the growth of the bones or make it crooked, right? What findings for a patient in skeletal traction indicates peripheral neurovascular impairment? And that's no pulse, no pulse. I mean, you might see pallor, um, and then you might see the numbness, et cetera, but it's all about that pulse. We want blood flow. A multi. How should the nurse care for the skeletal traction for a child with a fractured femur? All right, whatever. Shouldn't be. So when you have skeletal traction, skin traction, the whole thing is making sure every shift you show the weight. I mean, people come by, take things off, visitors, they don't know. So making sure, um, also make sure those weights are hanging freely and never ever remove them. You don't wanna remove it because those bones will go back and start that pain and muscle spasms again. When caring for a nine-year-old in Buck's traction, what action by the nurse is correct? <clears throat> so we're not going to let the kids sit. We're not going to raise the bed. We're not going to place no weights nowhere or leaving them where they are, but we are going to do those neurovascular checks at minimum every four hours. A select, which assessment indicates an infant has developmental dysplasia of a DDH? You're muted. Thank you so much. So you're gonna see asymmetrical leg folds, right? You're gonna see a shorter leg, positive moral is a startle reflex. And you're gonna hear the clicking and positive Babinski is when you have the splay in the bottom of the foot as a reflex. It's not, um, has nothing to do with this. All people should have that. What position do you put the legs of an infant with hip dysplasia? <clears throat> and it's abduction, very important, abduction. What statement by parents indicates more teaching regarding their two-year-old with infant with club foot. What are things we need to know about the treatment of club foot?
Now you think about children that age and how quickly that they heal. So a month is way too long to wait to do cast. It's every week they go and they change it. Those casts that I showed you were seven to 10 days apart, which is fine. And they need to do it quick because remember, every two to four weeks, it's all they need to heal. Okay, and again, they do need follow up care um, until they're grown looking at it. They might need special shoes or something. Multi, osteogenesis imperfecta. I had one child that had that and was in the newborn ICU. Oh, he was like six months. He was there after he was born. They are brittle bones and the bones are crooked. You know, sometimes these children, um, the parents are reported because they think it's child abuse. It's, it's, uh, I've seen some cases of it where in the end that they did diagnose them with osteogenesis imperfecta. But can you imagine having a kid with fractured bones and you can't describe it? And you're like, no, I would never hurt my kid. Um, so I've seen it happen before but it's something that you can't do anything for. You know, it's not curable. What is the pathologic cause of late calf birth disease? See, there's that fuzzy head of the femur there. You can see it on the right side of that picture. Ischemic aseptic necrosis of the femoral head, okay? Um, and the other one's just really good words, but it's ischemic head of the femur. It's caused by lack of blood flow. Typhosis. And that's humpback, that's the upper back that becomes curved. I mean, we usually see that in older women, but it, it can be kids. Lordosis is described as, I think that little girl there has it looks a very good picture of what it looks like. And it's that inward curve of that uh, lumbar spine. And that you'll see in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, right? Scoliosis. When you think of scoliosis, S, think the S-shaped curvature. And remember, if it's more than 40, 45, surgery is required, the Harrington rods. Before that, it's going to be braces and therapy. So adolescents with scoliosis have up to a 45-degree curvature of the spine would need to do what? And they're going to wear a brace 23 hours a day. It's that 45 where, you know, and when you're getting up to 45, you're close, okay? But they're going to try first the therapy and the brace 23 hours a day. What is osteomyelitis? So it is basically a bone that has an infection. IV antibiotics, right? Goals for juvenile idiopathic arthritis include what? Reduce joint pain and swelling and keep them mobile, right? Swimming, my favorite. A multi-select. 
what might you anticipate for a child diagnosed with JIA? <clears throat> so the joints can get disfigured sometimes in the morning and stiff difficulty walking and the uveitis facial rash is what lupus a multi-select what can help a child with lupus erythematosus prevent exasperations? Or flares, I like the word flares better. So we're going to wear sunscreen, decrease exposure, and then we're going to be given those prophylactic antibiotics, okay? Diet has nothing to do with lupus. What organs can lupus affect? <clears throat> Any of them. Any of them or all of them? What is cerebral palsy? It's all about body movement and muscle coordination. Very good. Myelomeningocele. is when the spinal cord and the meninges are pulled up and out. Remember the stretching of those nerves and you know what it can affect the urine and the stool and the movement of lower extremities. Infants with myelomeningocele demonstrate what? Motor and sensory impairments. You know, sometimes they can't move it. Sometimes they don't feel it. There's some paresthesia there. Myelomeningocele have decreased motor and sensations of lower extremities. The nurse should monitor closely what? Remember those muscles stretched and pulled and sometimes damaged. I mean, what do those nerves look at? What do they control? Urinary retention and bowel too, right? That's the lower extremities. A key feature of Duchenne muscular dystrophy is what? Boys ages three to seven. Lordosis and waddling gait, and it is a progressive muscle wastage. And again, we're worried the muscles are the diaphragm, and of course, the heart is what we're concerned later on. What is one of the procedures that a child with possible Duchenne's may need to diagnose this condition? It's called an EMG, and you just take these little um, cardiac monitor tabs, like, and you put a little electric shock, and you see if the muscles contract. Remember, post-procedure, many of these children's muscles ache. And it looks at the muscles and how they're working. How is Duchenne muscular dystrophy inherited? 
is it inherited? And it's the X-link recessive pattern. It's all the mom has given this to the child. Imagine how the mom feels. In caring for a patient with Gillian Barre, the priority concern is what? all about airway remember it all has to do with nerves and the nerves become they don't work and the nerve um the phrenic nerve which is all about the diaphragm um doesn't work and therefore you can't breathe so it's all about airway priority for a patient suffering with gillian beret they would complain of weakness that was what Remember, it starts with the feet and it works up. That's another word for that. And it's called ascending. And when it gets better, all of a sudden they start to breathe and then it's descending. Okay. Treatment for Gillian Bure includes what? I think maybe a Gillian Barre is due to an upper respiratory or a viral condition that happened several weeks before. They're, they're not really sure, but that's one, you know, thing that they're thinking of the causative reason. So antibiotics aren't going to do anything. Um, we don't need heparin. It's IVIG. So you're giving immunoglobins to support the immune system. And then of course, respiratory supports, number one. Maybe steroids too. What types of cerebral palsy causes hypertonicity and fine motor skills? Even poor gross motor skills. <clears throat> And it's called spastic. Very important one, remember spastic. What priority action should a nurse take to a patient with suspected spinal cord injury? What are you worried about? And that is all about making sure that that spine doesn't move. So you could break that spine and then you'll be paralyzed from the neck down or the, you know, the belly button down, whatever. You don't want to do anything. So a mobilized spine priority. You should get a tetanus shot every how many years? It's every 10 years. No, I have seen any changes. It used to be every two years, then it was every five years. Well, now they're saying every 10 years. And then if you have an incident where you've stepped on that rusty nail, you get a booster. Very important. So you don't get tetanus. What is the symptom of tetanus? <clears throat> And we're going to be treating it by washing that wound with soap and water, antibiotic ointment. And it's called a lockjaw. And remember, once you get lockjaw, it's very serious. Um, and four days later, if you're still alive, you might make it. It's that serious. Last question. Most common causes of spinal cord injuries are what? Motor vehicles, remember, that's always number one. Driving it or now, you know, we have the adolescents who are now driving too, and sports. Very good. Number three, Ashley. Good job, Ashley. Number two, another Ash. Hello, Ash. And number one, APA. Is that the seventh edition or the sixth edition? Kim and Archie, good job, guys.
So what I'm going to do is, you know, it's the end of class. If you all want to take the quiz, you are more than welcome to do it just as, you know, an extra. Let me make sure that I had it set up at least for five. So make sure that it's earlier than that. <clears throat> or else it won't work yet, right? Did everybody want to take it? All right? Doesn't hurt. Doesn't doesn't do anything to harm you. So remember, this week you have your reviews, and remember, um, exam next week. And following the exam, I'm going to be starting our HESI reviews. I've got some really good stuff for y'all, so that you know I expect you all to get 99.99. How's that? Would you like that? You study, you can do it. I know you can. <laughs>